Testing, one, two, three. Is this good? Good, keep talking, okay. Testing, testing. <sighs> I don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> testing, one, two, three. Can I go now? No?
Good morning, New World Church. Good morning, those who are watching us online. Uh, I would like to draw your attention on a couple of announcements. First of all, this is church business, and we would like to recommend, according to the church board's recommendation, two names to be accepted into the fellowship and membership of New World Church. The first individual is Josef Omchikus from Pula, Seventh-day Adventist Church, Croatia. And uh, the second person is Alexander Genov from Sofia, Bulgaria. So is there a second to this recommendation? Yes, there is. So those in favor of accepting these people into our membership, please indicate by raising your right hand. Thank you very much. Opposed by the same sign? It is carried. Thank you very much. I would also like to draw your attention on this month. This month is about relationships, family, and also human relationships. Yesterday evening, we had a wonderful evening with uh, Bernie and Karen Holford. And uh, we need to tell you that uh, in this month, every single Friday, Sabbath, Sabbath morning and Sabbath afternoon, we are concentrating on families and also issues related to families. Friday evening, we are going to have Dr. Gabor Mihalets from Hungary at half past seven next Friday in Salisbury Hall. He's going to preach also here next Sabbath from 11.15. And six o'clock from next Sabbath, we are going to have a meeting with the parents. So there are many important issues related to sexuality, related to relationships, related to family matters we would like to discuss. So please note these into your calendar that during the month of October, this is what is going to happen. We also have Leslie Aki, who are, is going to come and uh, have seminars Friday evening and also Sabbath morning preaching and Sabbath afternoon or evening for parents. So note this and visit our website and uh, please sign up for these events, bring your children along, bring your teenagers along and Let's have a blessed October when we are enhancing our family relationships. Today we have again Karen and Bernie Holford with us and we are delighted actually to have you as our guests today. Looking forward to your ministry uh, this Sabbath and also two Sabbaths from now. May God bless you and may God bless our church. And I'm inviting now uh, Johnny Becheas to introduce us and lead us in worship. Good morning to all of you here and those of you who are watching us online. Very warm welcome from the New Bold community today. I invite you to allow God's peace and his Holy Spirit to come to us now. Above all else, I invite you to enjoy this hour and a half of worship. I have a favor to ask. Please wear a mask. The church board, the safety committee, they worked hard to produce the recommendations. There is a number of us who are elderly who will not be able to come to church if you don't wear a mask unless you have the exemption from the doctor. Please respect that. Our first hymn is To God Be the Glory. The lyrics are by Fanny Crosby, first published in 1875. Crosby wrote lyrics for many songs, including Blessed Assurance, and was known as the mother of the modern 
congregational singing in America. Dwight Moody, his evangelistic campaigns were extremely successful, they said, due to Fanny Crosby's songs that were used. Today, we too have a famous preachers who will deliver the message. So let us follow Maria and Chanel and sing to God be the glory. Let us remain standing as we pray. Our Heavenly Father, we have come here today to give praise and to give thanks to you for your mighty acts of love and grace. We see you and your acts of creation in every part of the beautiful nature, in the autumnal changes in the trees, in neatly harvested fields, and in the wildlife around us. Our Redeemer, we see your divine character revealed to us in the scriptures. We see your compassion when people around us are kind and compassionate towards us. And we experience your grace when we are gracious towards others, whether they belong to the, this church or not. But it is for this church now that we give special thanks. And we ask for special blessings for those people who have recently accepted various functions in this church. Give them wisdom and patience and bless them. And it is for the Newbold College students that we ask your blessings as well as they began, begin their new semester. Lord, we ask you to forgive our weak and inconsistent nature. We are not only short of petrol and some items in superstores, 
but we are often short of love and understanding of others. How can we be peacemakers when we are short of these? Bring your tankers, Lord, full of Holy Spirit and fill us and all those who may be today discouraged, who may be unwell, may be sad. Lift us in your mercy, Father, and talk to us today here in this church. Let us see your face through a friendly smile and a greeting from a deacon or deaconess. Let us hear your voice through the music, through the children's story, the baby dedication, scripture reading, and the sermon. How else are we going to know that you are here? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, Darren and Magda have brought with them uh, little Olivia for us to pray a prayer of dedication. Um, I think I'm going to take this off. It should be okay. Yeah, that's all right. Good. Um, I asked them uh, why they had chosen the name Olivia. Apparently, it comes from a Latin word, Oliver, uh, which comes from an olive tree, so I guess that's no real um, surprise to any of us, which is often a symbol of peace, um, whether you were hoping that she would bring peace or whether that's actually happening, I don't know, um, but we can, we can think the best of uh, little Olivia today. Um, I just wanted to read a text for you that um, Moses gave in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And I'm just going to read from verse 4 to 9. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you, you are to, are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Just three very quick thoughts from that. Number one, he says, think about God's word. That's why it says there in verse 6, um, these are to be on your hearts. Think about God's word, which is really important. Um, as parents, you bring God's word to your children to little Olivia. I, the, the first scripture I remember um, that I was taught as a child after we had prayed was, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. My mother taught me that, and I still remember it to this day. So let, the, let God's word be on your heart and teach Olivia, and I know you're already doing that with Abigail anyway, um, to have God's word in her heart. The second thing here is talk about God's word. It says here, verse 7, um, talk about them, uh, impress them on your children because you're teaching. And it says here, when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up, look for teachable moments all the time, basically, because you are always teaching. You're always teaching your children. Um, I found something somebody said, uh, what my parents taught me, my parents taught me to appreciate a job well done. When they said, if you're going to kill each other, do it outside, I just finished cleaning. <laughs> my parents taught me religion. You better pray that comes out of the carpet. <laughs> you're always teaching. My parents taught me foresight. Make sure you wear clean underwear in case you're in an accident. Now, I know many people have heard that one before, yeah? 
My parents taught me stamina. You will sit there until you have eaten up all that spinach. And the last one, my parents taught me about hypocrisy. If I've told you once, I've told you a million times, don't exaggerate. You're always teaching. Basically, that's what he's saying here in verse 7. When you're walking, when you're sitting, whatever you're doing, your lives are a constant teaching. So teach your children, you will always be doing that. And then the final thing uh, that he says here is to practice God's word. He says here to uh, verses 8 and 9, tie them on your hands, on your foreheads, the frames of your house, basically make the foundation of your home a biblical one. And, uh, and I know that's what you want. That's why you're bringing uh, little Olivia here for us to, to pray a prayer of dedication. And for us as a church family to witness that and to say we are behind you and with you all the way. Now, Olivia was born uh, just over a year ago. Yeah. One-year-olds tend to be really skeptical. Have you noticed that? Um, now, let me see if she will come to me. I doubt it, but let's see. Hello. Hi there. That's good. <laughs> That's good. Come over here. Come over here. She's supposed to be skeptical at this age, which is quite okay. <laughs> that's, what, that's, that's the phase I go through. Come. So let us uh, bow our heads as we pray together. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the instructions we can get from your word. We thank you for giving us as parents, for sharing with us the ability to procreate life, just like you can. We thank you, Lord, for the awesome responsibility of having children. And Lord, we want to present before you family Johnston this morning. We thank you for blessing them with little Olivia. And we pray, Lord, that you would guide and bless them as a family unit. Bless Abigail as big sister, to be a good uh, role model, but just to be a great friend to her little sister. We thank you for Darren and Magda. And Lord, may you continue to bless them with your uh, patience and your love and your grace so that their home will be one in which you are loved and in which you are shown. And we want to pray for little Olivia as well, Lord. We ask that you would keep your hand of guidance and blessing over her all the days of her life. Lord, may you, you bless and keep her always. May she enjoy health and strength throughout her whole life. May she know that she is loved. And may she one day choose to follow you with her whole life as well. And so we thank you that we can present this family to you and know that you will be with them through whatever is ahead. We know that we're in a world that is dangerous, that is just not safe in many ways, but we just pray that your angels would keep charge over this family. And we thank you that they can rest in that. And so we pray that you, Lord, will bless and keep little Olivia. May you make your face shine upon her and be gracious to her. May you lift up your countenance upon her and give her peace all the days of her life is our prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Hey. Okay, that's all right. You can <laughs> so we have a little certificate for you to remember today by. Um, that's where you're laughing and smiling, Jerry. Is that you? Okay, maybe not. Uh, do you want to hold that to your little sister? Thank you very much, and God bless you, and uh, please make welcome this uh, family unit. God bless you. Thank, Thank you. It is wonderful to see all of your faces here today. And I think we can say it is so wonderful to worship together again, even with masks on our faces, it's wonderful to hear your voices as well. And I'm really glad that now we can all worship our Lord with a, not only one of the most popular hymns, it is well with my soul, but 
with a hymn of confidence that no matter what is happening, we know in our soul that God is with us and it's really, really well. So I would like to invite you to stand and yeah, I'd like to hear you singing your heart out for this one. Hello children, it's good to see you all coming to the front, that's lovely, where are you all, there you are, so many children, hi, have you all got a space, welcome, nice to see you, wow, there are so many. I think there's more children than grown-ups. I think you beat them today. I want to ask you a question. It's a bit of a 
a difficult question. Do you ever get angry? You don't have to put your hands up. Do you ever get angry? Sometimes I do. Yeah, I can hear some people being really honest here. I bet some of the grown-ups get angry too. Do you think so? Yeah, yeah. I wonder what makes you really angry. What makes you angry? Is it when you lose the game? Uh-huh, yeah. Is it, is it when someone messes up your stuff? Mm, yes. Is it when you don't get the dinner you wanted? Maybe. You'll get angry when you lose the game. Mm, it happens, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you about a little boy called Simon, and he used to get really angry. He used to get so angry, he used to yell and throw things and say nasty things to his mummy and daddy. I bet you never do any of those things, do you? Oh, you did. Oh, okay. Right, it's good that people are honest here. And one day, he got so very angry, he ran out of the house and into the road, and he nearly got hit by a car. <gasps> Is that scary? Simon was scared, Mummy was scared, and Daddy was scared. And Simon says, I am so fed up with being angry. I wish I could stop. But sometimes, it's like a big monster comes and bites me, <laughs> like that. And then I just get madder and madder and madder, and I can't control it, and I don't like it. And mummy said, I know what you mean. I don't like getting angry either. But Simon says, you don't yell and throw things and run away. Mummy smiled and she said, no, not anymore. When I feel angry, you know what I do, she said. I take a deep breath like this, <sighs> like a big sigh. Can you do that? <sighs> and it calms her down. And daddy said, I used to get angry too. But he said, when I was at school, I realized that even when my teacher made me really mad, I never got angry with her, because she was like a really important person. Um, but I used to get angry with my mum and dad and my little brother. And then I thought, you know what? If I can not get angry at my teacher, maybe I can pretend my mummy and my daddy and my little brother are really important people too, because they are. And then that will help me not to be so angry. So Daddy said, every time I feel like getting angry, I imagine the other person's really important. And that helps me to stay calm. But Simon says, there's nothing I do that helps me to stay calm. I just get angry and I can't control it. And I'm scared. And Daddy said, well, it's sad that you're scared and we don't want you to be scared and we don't want you to throw things and yell and hurt people. So I know what we're going to do. We're going to pray and we're going to ask God for an idea about how to help you calm down and not get so angry. So Daddy prayed, and when he opened his eyes, he had an idea. He said, hey, Simon, I remember that time last week when you were about to get really angry, and you were all ready to, to yell, and you stopped. You didn't get angry. You managed to calm down all by yourself. That is amazing. Because if you could calm down all by yourself then, maybe you can do it again. Mummy said, yes, that's a really good idea. Let's think about what you did that calmed you down. Simon, can you remember what you did? Well, Simon had to screw his face up really tight because like last week was a really long time ago. And then he remembered what he did. He was really mad, but suddenly he stopped. Just like that. He took a deep breath like Mummy did, that big sigh thing. Because he did a big breath, he couldn't yell, so he went all shh at the same time. And then he said, I had some space to think, and I thought about how I could do something a bit nicer. He said, well, when I thought about it, I took a step closer to you, and I said, sorry for not obeying you, and then we had a big, squishy hug. And he said, Daddy, what are you doing? And Daddy said, well, I'm just writing down everything you said so we don't forget what it was. And Simon looked at the list and he said, hey, that's funny. Everything begins with S. Stop, a sort of sigh -sh thing, then some space, and then a step forward, and then a sorry, and then a big squishy hug. 
He said there were six things. And mummy said, and they all begin with S, six S's. So Simon said, I've got six S's. And then he said, that sounds like success. These are my six S's of success. This is what I can do the next time I feel like being angry. So he wrote down this list of six S's, which are stop, sigh, sh, space, step, sorry, and squishy hug, or smile if a squishy hug's a bit, like not what you want to do, something friendly anyway. So he wrote this list down and he put it on the back of his bedroom door so he would see it every single day and it would remind him of his six S's of success. Well, Simon didn't get so angry after that. He did sometimes get angry, because we all do. And he didn't always stay calm, because neither do the rest of us. But they really helped him. And as he grew up, he told other people about his six S's of success and helped them to find their own way to calm down too. Now, I'm going to get you to practice them with me. Can you stand up now? And... The grown-ups can't see, but I want to see what your angry face really looks like. Pretend like you're really going to get angry. Can you get really angry? Wow, it's pretty scary, folks. Yeah, all these angry faces. Okay, so remember what we do first. We're feeling angry, and then what do we do? We stop, and then we take a big sigh. Shh. You can do that. Shh. And then we take some space to think how we can be a bit kinder and nicer. Can you do that? Make some space with your hands. So think around your head. And then take a little step towards the person that you're fighting with. Mm -hmm. And you say sorry if you need to. Can you say sorry? Sorry, sorry yes. Okay. And then give yourself a big squish or a smile and make friends again. You know, those things might help you. Next time you feel angry and you need to calm down, remember Simon's six S's of success. And maybe they'll help you. And maybe you'll find your own way to calm down because God wants to help each one of you find your own special way to calm yourself down so that we don't get angry and hurt other people. And when you leave here, you can take a little list of Simon's six S's off the front desk and a special activity called Kindness Tag, which you can take and do in your home so to help you remember what you learned. And there's some handouts for the grown-ups too. But before we go, we're going to have a prayer. Can you close your hands, put your hands together? Father God, we thank you that you love us all the time, and we thank you especially that you love us even when we get angry and we throw things and yell and hurt one another. But please help us to learn from you how to find ways to calm down, because we want to show love to other people and not hurt them. Thank you for helping us and giving us peace. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Oh, yet... We want to sing a song together with you. Did you just learn about the peace and how you can have some strategies to keep calm? We want, oh, I, I have lots of little helpers here. Come with me. So now we want to do a song, I've got peace like a river. Do you know that song? Okay, so I need helpers. Who would like to come here in front? You all can come. We need to tease the grown a little bit of the actions. Thank you. Can, you want to sing with me? So, who are my helpers? You can come here, please. And you know that song, I've got peace like a river. This is peace like a river. Okay, where are my helpers? Come, 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 come. You all can come here if you want. You all can be my helpers. We can teach the grown-ups how to do these actions. Okay, so do you know this song, right? I've got peace like a river. Can you show me how do we do peace? Peace like a river. Grown-ups, please pay attention. You will need to do it as well. Okay, peace like the river. Next one is what? Next one is love. How do we do love? Can you show me a little heart? Okay, I've got love like an ocean, big ocean. So you need to have some space here as well. And the last one is joy like a fountain. Joy, a smiley face. Show your smiley face. And then a big fountain. Can we do that? Okay, my helpers, all of you. Did you remember the moves? Can you show me quickly? Joy. Sorry, we're starting with peace, right? I've got peace. Peace. 
like a river. Where's the river? Okay, and then we do in my soul, right? We can just point to our soul. Next one is love. Where is love? Beautiful love, like an ocean. Where is a big ocean? Yes, you need to have space. And then the last one is joy, smiley face. Where is your smiley face? Like a fountain. How do we point to fountain? <laughs> big fountain water going everywhere. Very good. Okay, we can now start singing this song and teaching our grown-ups how to do it. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. Now is love. I've got love. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean. I've got love like an ocean in my soul. And now joy, your smiley faces. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain. I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Very good. Thank you very much. With Semida in the choir, you can go to the school. The scripture reading today is found in Romans chapter 12, verses 9 to 21, and uh, I will be reading it from the Message Bible. Love from the center of who you are, don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil, hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply, practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out, keep yourself fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times, pray all the harder. Help needy Christians, be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies, no cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they are happy. Share tears when they are down. Get along with each other, don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobody, don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back, discover beauty in everyone. If you got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even, that is not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tells us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. 
Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. Praise be to God. Good morning, everyone. It's lovely to be with you here. And it's wonderful that you're having this special, this special month of focus on family and relationships because they're at the very heart of everything we do. It's in the family that we learn about love and we learn what God's love means in those everyday one-to-one -one relationships. So I'm really pleased that you're taking this special time to focus on family. And as I was wondering what to talk about this morning, I thought, there's something we don't talk about very often in church, and it's really crucial for healthy relationships. And that's what do we do about conflict. But this morning, it's going to be a slightly different perspective. Quite often, we think about um, how to solve a conflict once it's happened, how to mend things. But today, we're going to find out how you can reduce conflicts in your life every day. Now, I imagine that Abigail in the Bible had lots of practice in peacemaking. Being married to Nabal couldn't have been an easy thing. He seemed to be such a mean and surly man, always upsetting the neighbors, thinking that just because he had so much money, he could treat people any way he wanted. And he treated them badly in his clumsy and foolish way. And I imagine that Abigail, his wise, kind, beautiful, and long-suffering wife, was always ready with a store cupboard of stuff to take to the neighbors on her donkeys to make amends, to pour oil on troubled waters, her food, her treats, her baking, the cakes, whatever it was, to try and calm things down again. I mean, how else would she have had hundreds of loaves of bread and cakes and other goodies all stacked on her shelves, ready to take at a moment's notice when it was needed? We find the story of Nabal and David's conflict and Abigail's peacemaking in 1 Samuel 25. And if we explore the story, it's not just a fairy tale romance of a wise and kind and beautiful country girl being rescued from an evil man by the heart of a king in waiting and becoming a princess. What we discover in her story are secrets that can help us today in our peacemaking. How we can do things every day to minimize, to lower, to reduce the risk of us having conflicts with those around us. So, long story short, Samuel has just died. David is sad. He's grieving his friend and mentor. So he has all kinds of mixed feelings in his body. As he's doing his grieving, he's taking care of his men. He's doing lots of things for God. And it's sheep shearing time, which actually is party time in his culture. So lots of mixed emotions. But he's rather low on feasting supplies for his um, hundreds of men that he's taking care of. And he remembers that his men have been taking care of Nabal's sheep and cattle and protecting them, the herds and the herdsmen, and really making sure that they're safe and well. And he thinks it's about time. We've done so many favors for Nabal. It's about time we ask this guy, who's a multimillionaire, for a little bit of food to help us with our party in gratitude for all our help and kindness. But Nabal is having none of it. He's rude. He dismisses David. He's unwilling to give him even a loaf of bread. And David is furious. He plans to take murderous revenge on Nabal's entire household for his meanness and his bad attitude. But fortunately, a young shepherd runs and talks to Abigail and tells her what's happening. Immediately, she stops what she's doing. She loads as much party food as possible onto the donkeys and goes to make peace. And when she meets David, she kneels at his feet. She takes responsibility for the problem. She takes responsibility of her husband because he's stu too stupid to know what he's doing. Offer the gifts of food to warm his heart. Appeals to his rational brain and wiser self not to be left with a lingering and heavy guilt all of his life for unnecessary bloodshed. Pronounces rich blessings of care and protection on him. And David calms down. Abigail's gentle, warm blessing and her generosity soothes his heart and he appreciates her intervention. 
he decides not to take revenge and sends her home in peace. Phew, Abigail thinks, everyone's safe now. But peacemaking isn't always this easy, and conflict is often complex. So what I'm sharing won't solve all the problems in the world, but it will give us some simple things that we can choose to do every day to reduce the amount of conflict in our relationships and limit the damage that they can cause. Because peacemaking, by its very nature, means that we do something proactive. We make the peace, like Abigail, to create more peaceful relationships. Isn't that something we all want? to have more peaceful relationships. And blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Because when we make peace with others, people will say, you are just like God. He must be your father. Because God is creating the biggest peacemaking exercise in the whole universe right now. And so he's the ultimate peacemaker. And we can be like him. So why be peacemakers? Why is it so important? Unresolved conflicts break relationships. Conflict and relationships break down, and that has a negative effect on mental health, our physical health, our spiritual health, our emotional health, and even on financial health when families split up. Did you know that more than 60% of the people walking away from our church cite some kind of conflict as their main reason for leaving. And thousands of people every year become homeless because of a conflict in their family. Conflict is normal. We're always going to have it. Everyone has it. Happy couples have conflict, and unhappy couples have conflict. We have all kinds of conflict around us all the time. But the quality of our relationship will affect how we manage that conflict, and how easily we can make peace or create peace. Because conflict is actually there to alert us, hey, we're different. You're not the same as me. You have a different need, a different perspective. And what we need to do is understand each other. That conflict is a sign to stop, listen, understand, learn more about the other person, so that you can then take care of them better, create peace with them better, and have a more understanding relationship. Because out of the little conflicts we have every day, Bernie and I, over the past 38 years, have grown to understand how we tick, what we like, what we don't like, what to avoid, what to do more of, so that our relationship is more peaceful. So conflict reduction, doesn't just focus on resolving the conflict once it's happened and say, okay, we've argued, now how do we make amends? It says we can actually lower the incidence of conflict by proactively peacemaking ahead of time by living our relationships in ways that will lower the amount of conflict we have. Isn't that good news? You can prevent it or lower the risk by what you do every single day. Now, there was a lady called Sue Johnson who did some research, and she actually watched couples arguing for 20 years on video to try and figure out what was going on. And what she found out was that couples are rarely arguing about what it looks like they're arguing about, who's doing the dishes, the money, how to deal with the kids, whatever. What they're usually arguing about are some, um, there's some big questions underneath. So they don't argue about those big questions because they may not even realize what they are. But there's something in the relationship that feels a little unsafe, a little wobbly. And when we feel a little wobbly in a relationship and not as closely connected, um, then we start to niggle and irritate and be a bit more vulnerable if we encounter a conflict or something that's not going smoothly. And Sue Johnson discovered that underneath um, every conflict, there were these big questions. And these big questions are, do you really care about me? Do you care? Do you really love me? Do you appreciate me? Are you grateful for what I do for you? Am I important in your life? Do you appreciate what I'm doing? Can you empathize with my feelings? Can you understand what this means to me my, right now and how I'm feeling? Are you willing to help me when I'm struggling, or do you just let me deal with it on my own? And will you always be there for me? Can I really trust you? Are you committed to me? 
And when we answer those questions in our everyday life, by the way that we relate to each other, and then it lowers the, um, the likelihood that we'll have a conflict. Because if I feel safe and loved and appreciated and supported, then that settles me down inside, and I'm not so likely to be prickly and on the edge and more likely to have a conflict. So happy couples will still have conflicts, and, but they're likely to be less distractive and less hurtful. So sometimes Bernie and I were doing a presentation on conflict, and we want to give a good example from our life. And actually, it's quite hard, because we know we have these little conflicts. We, you know, different things happen, and you sort them out, and you talk about them. But they just go. We resolve it, and we move on. But if a couple comes to me as a family therapist, and they're having major arguments, they can tell me, word by word, blow for blow, detail for detail, every single detail of every single argument they've had in the last month. Because they're much more destructive and hurtful, there is more adrenaline going on, they, one hurt leads to another and it escalates, and it becomes really big. But we can reduce those conflicts, the incidence of them, if we live our lives in ways that answer these big questions well, so that we're not so wobbly and shaky, when a conflict comes along. It's also really important to repair your relationship before bedtime. The Bible says, don't let the anger go down on your wrath. And now we know, just recently, the research has come out that if you have an argument with your teenager, and then after that they tried it again with anybody and couples, they found that if you resolve it before bedtime, then, they, then somehow the brain deals with it better, and the brain is soothed. If you sleep on it, though, then that unresolved conflict can lead to greater anxiety and actually depression, particularly in teenagers and young people. And it's actually up to the more mature person, the older person, to take a step into that and make sure things are resolved before bedtime, particularly with teenagers and children and young people. So repair as quickly as you can. So how do we lay these foundations that will help us to have relationships where conflict is less likely? The first one is being kind as often as possible. The more often we're kind in the relationship, even if we don't feel like it, then the, the more the relationship can, um, well, the conflict will reduce in the relationship. Small kindnesses matter, however small they are. And that's why we've given the children this kindness tag um, sheets to take away to play in their homes. And this is what Abigail does. Abigail chooses generous kindness. She gathers the best she can to take to David um, to um, show her kindness to him, and that helps to bring peace into the situation. The next thing we need to do is show appreciation as much as possible. The more often you thank the people around you, the less likely they will fight with you and you'll have a conflict as easy as that. Well, maybe not quite so easy. But the more we thank people and they feel appreciated, the less resentful they feel, and there isn't that undercurrent of discomfort on which, um, which can trigger conflict. So say thank you as often as you can. Appreciate people. Look for creative ways to show your appreciation of each other. And Abigail actually shows her respect and appreciation of David in the speech that she makes to him to try and bring peace. She shows that appreciation. We also need to focus on the other person's emotions. Be aware of what the people in our house are feeling every day. Check in with them. What's the happiest thing that happened to you today? What was the saddest thing? How are you feeling? How can I help you with that? And express your compassion of them. Uh, Paul says, be sad with people who are sad and be happy with those who are happy. So connect with them on their feelings. Show that you understand, identify them. And that way, when people feel that you understand their feelings, they feel loved and cared for. And that will, again, reduce the incidence and the chances of having a conflict. And Abigail shows deep sympathy for David's situation. She cares not just about how he's feeling now, like he's hungry and stressed and everything, but she actually anticipates how he might feel in the future if he looks back on this incident and if he creates violence in the family, and he lives to regret it. 
So she says, I don't want you to feel bad about something you did wrong at this time, so please don't do that. I don't want you to have that trouble in your heart. So she empathizes with even his future feelings of guilt and shame and tries to help him think about that as well and shows that she cares. Something else that we do that can lower conflict is just helping each other every day, saying, how can I help you? Let's do this together. Know what the person you love hates doing and do it for them or get someone else to do it, pay for someone to do it, um, so that you're not overloading someone with lots of things they hate doing and they just feel burdened. Um, Paul says, carry each other's burdens and then this fulfills the law of Christ. So supporting each other, helping each other, again, lowers that resentment, builds that caring connection. I feel loved and cared for when Bernie does things to help me. And this week has been particularly busy, and he's actually cooked dinner about three or four times this week, which has been amazing. So I'm really glad his mum trained him how to do that. So being helpful can you know, lower our stress and lower the amount of conflicts. And I'm sure that lowered the amount of conflicts we've had this week as well. So protect your relationship. Because if someone feels vulnerable in the relationship, they feel insecure, and you say, if you do that again, I'll leave, or something like that, then that insecurity makes them panic, and then it increases their stress hormones, and they're more likely to go into uh, a more active conflict mode with you. Perfect love casts out fear. And when we create fear in relationships, then people are actually more likely to have a conflict with you. When we know how to soothe that fear, take the fears away, understand what the fears are and sort them out, then we calm people down and they're going to be less likely to have a conflict with us. So there we are. We have protect your relationship, help each other, be understanding and empathic, be kind, be thankful. These are simple things that you all do, that you can all do every day. And being aware of it and doing more of them will help to lower your conflicts. Try it and see what happens, because the research is backing up all of these things now. Abigail didn't have this brain science to help her, but we have the brain science now to say what she was doing was amazing. How she created peace was using all this wisdom um, that we know now that she didn't know anything about. But, you know, even when we try our best, David and his men have been kind, generous, protective, and supportive of Nabal's men and his flocks. They'd done everything they could to build a good relationship with him and to try and avoid a conflict. And sometimes we just meet those people who are dying for a fight, and, and, and Nabal literally died for a fight. And that's life, but at least we can do our part. We can be the peacemakers doing our part in this process. And even if it's not appreciated, not understood, still keep doing it, because every time we do one of these things and our, in our close relationships, we're actually doing something to bring greater peace in the world. The great peace that needs to happen in the world starts in the home, in the way that we make peace with each other so that we develop peaceful, peacemaking children and teenagers who will go into the world and make the world a more peaceful place. Well, remember the children's story, Simon six S's of success. They're good for us as well. They're all things that can help us calm down when we have a conflict. And actually, if you look at them, they're things that Abigail did too. So as soon as she heard the news about Nabal's foolishness, she stopped whatever she was doing, I'm sure. She must have. She took a deep breath. <sighs> right, what do we do this time? Quickly reflected on the situation. And then she, um, she stepped towards David. She rode towards him on her donkey to meet him, to stop him doing whatever he was going to do. She apologized on behalf of Nabal and said, we can't expect anything better from him, but I'll apologize <coughs> on behalf of him. <coughs> and then she showed her care for David. She didn't squish him and hug him, not then, maybe later, but she did uh, show her care by giving lots of nice food to him. So how does conflict escalate? Because we need to be really aware of what happens when conflict escalates. So if we experience criticism, a lack of support and connection, and little appreciation, if all those negative things are happening, it's much harder for our brains to handle conflict well. We're kind of wired up then to look out for a threat and to be ready to, to attack it. So stress, anxiety, and fear, they stimulate the release of cortisol hormone in our brain. 
And that makes us more likely to become verbally aggressive, to shout, to uh, abuse others' feelings, and even become violent and hurt other people. And then conflict escalates. So when our cortisol levels are raised, it's much harder for us to have empathy for others. It kind of cuts off the connection to the part of our brain that is sensible, feeling, identifies other people's feelings, cares for them, and can listen well. We basically shut that down with a big barrier, and we go into fight or flight reactions, which you've all heard of. And then it's much harder for us to turn things around and get calm again. Once we've switched that button, we become thoughtless, selfish, and uncaring. Um, and that's what happened when, David, when Nabal was rude to David, David went into threat mode, and he went into fight mode. And he's already grieving Samuel. He's stressed. He's got all these men who are hungry and want to party, and he's got no food. And there's a lot going on for David. And Nabal is just the last straw, his reaction. And so the conflict escalates for him. But the good news is, is we can also help our brains to manage our conflicts better. So when we experience or offer some empathy, understanding feelings, some compassion to people, when we're kind, generous, when we help them, then, and show appreciation, then a hormone called oxytocin starts flowing into our mind. And when we do this for the other person, it starts flowing into their mind too. And when we're operating on oxytocin connection rather than cortisol fight and flight disconnection, then our brains can manage the conflict better. And Abigail, again, without knowing this brain science, she had the wisdom to know that her loving care and her compassion and her generosity would connect with David at this level. She was, she was very high on oxytocin. She was a very caring, loving woman. We can see that in her life. And she wanted to activate that in David's brain, even though she didn't know what she was doing. So when we're relating warmly to others, we can... We, we then connect very well with the caring and relating reflective parts of our brain. When we have the oxytocin, it's much easier for us to show empathy, to respond wisely and kindly, creatively, humbly and unselfishly to our challenges and to our potential conflicts. It's Abigail's kindness and generosity that helped David's brain to soothe, to get into a better place, to make a much better choice, to avoid the fight response and she helped to make peace. And we can use this science as well. So rather than activate the, the fight or flight mode in someone else by the way that we relate to them, uh, that, that they perceive as an attack, then we, we can show them that we care <coughs> and be kind to them and nice to them, and it will lower that, and then we'll be able to relate more positively together. So what else can we do to help? One thing is that when we do need to talk about something that might be a little bit tricky, it's good to start warmly. Start warmly, kindly, show that you care about the other person, help them to feel safe in the conversation, because by that way, you've activated that lovely oxytocin that will help them to stay calm and have a much better discussion about your differences than you might have if you've activated their, their stress system. So express your care for them and express your concerns in a kind and non-judgmental way. And this is how Abigail related to David. She didn't go in attacking him. She went in in this gentle, warm way to help him think, oh, she's not going to threaten me. She's not going to be difficult. She's kind. She's generous. I'm safe here. Then he can, he can calm down as well. And then we can change our voice. It's amazing the power of our voice. When we raise our voice and shout then on, and escalate our voice and get higher and higher, that happens when we have a, a big row, then we actually activate that cortisol again. The other person perceives a threat, the yelling makes them scared, and they, they get frightened, and they go into that more, um, more con actively, aggressively conflictual mode. But Abigail used her voice well. We don't know the tone of her voice, but I imagine it was warm, it was calm, it was soothing. That she spoke calmly and kindly. She had an amazing speech to show her care, her respect for David, and it's, it's well worth reading. It's a, an amazing speech of, con of conflict reduction and peacemaking. She used respectful language. She honored him. She knew that he was going to be king one day, and she speaks to that. And she helps him to lower his stress by her gentle answer 
which turns away wrath. And then, she, um, it's important when we're in a conflict situation, we can express our concerns aggressively. I want this. Why haven't you done that? You always do this. And those are things that we hear that will get us stressed and invite us into quite a nasty conflict if we're not careful. But this is a model, this process here that's on the screen, is a model for sharing a concern in a calm, respectful, polite, collaborative way. And actually, David could have used this um, and helped him with, with Nabal, perhaps. Um, but I think nothing would help Nabal. But we'll think about what David could have said in each of these situations. So be specific. In this specific situation, and David would say, when we've been caring and protecting your flocks and looking after your men, and then this specific thing happens, that we come to you to ask for food, and you are rude and unhelpful and uncooperative, then I feel, I feel frustrated and I feel unappreciated and sad because I've gone to all this effort to help you and you can't help me back. And it would really help me if you would just show a little bit of appreciation by giving us some food for our sheep shearing party. This is one idea. What ideas do you have that would help us to work this out together? Um, honor one another above yourselves. This is an honoring one another above ourselves conversation. It's clear, it's specific, it's non-blaming, and in this specific situation, when this specific thing happens, I feel because, and it would really help me if you would do this, and then I could help you by doing this, and what ideas do you have? So that we invite the other person to share their ideas because that's respectful too. So we need to be uh, collaborative about how we solve our, our problems. We can need to admit our contribution to the problem if there is one. Say, you know, I, I wasn't very helpful this morning when I did this, and, and I'm sorry. So when we admit our part in the conflict, that can help to lower it down. It, it's not like we're pushing all the blame on the other person. And the best thing to do is share the responsibility for the problem. Because when we share responsibility for the problem, we are together and we put the problem over there. But if I blame you for the problem, I put the problem in between us and it comes between us and you're over there and I'm on this side and we create the conflict, the gulf between us. By sharing responsibility for the problem, we put ourselves on the same side against the problem. And then we use words like we, our and us. When we do that, we show we're on their side. This is about us. We want to work this out together. And when we use that kind of language, that also helps people to feel safe. They don't feel they're going to be blamed. They're going to have to fix something difficult. They feel like we can do this together. And then some very simple things help. If you use the word and rather than but, then it can really help bring you together. So you say, you want this, but I want this immediately you're pushed apart. But if you say, well, you want this and I want this, now I wonder how we can have, find a way to have both, have a win-win solution. <coughs> we need to aim for win-win where possible. That's the best way to solve our conflict, that both of us win in the situation. Nabal didn't understand this win-win thing. He wanted to win. And the thing is, when we want to win all the time, we lose. And what loses, what breaks, the relationships with the people around us. Because when we win all the time and they lose, they don't want to be around us anymore. We break the most precious relationships. What's more important to you? Winning the argument or protecting your relationship? So we need to do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, says Paul. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but to the interest of the others. So it's about how do we together work on a win-win situation. Abigail went for win-win. David's men got their food. Her family got protected. She created a win-win situation. They both got what they wanted out of the situation, and that was a blessing. So something else that happens in conflicts is that we often have an argument between our brain and our heart. And they speak different languages. And Bernie and I discovered this quite a few years ago now. So what happened was that we were actually both studying family therapy at the time. And we had three teenagers. And we decided that actually, if our 
kids were going to learn how to have healthy conflicts in their families. They need to have some good examples of parents who love each other, dealing with their conflicts in a calm and rational way, and finding good solutions. That was the goal. So the idea was we'd choose some conflicts we thought we could sort out quite nicely and have them occasionally in front of the children. We don't know what this argument was about, but this one did not go to plan. So our voices are getting more and more loud, and we're completely forgetting that there's three teenagers around us, and we're yelling and yelling louder and louder, and suddenly our middle child, Nathan, the peacemaker, he knocks on the table, made a much louder sound than that, said, Mom, Dad, stop! You're behaving like children. Who do you think you are? Like you're studying family therapy, and you tell everyone about relationships, and this is rubbish. You're behaving like kids. Sort yourselves out. And we're like, oh my goodness me, what have we raised here? And then, then Nathan, Nathan turns to, to Hans to Bernie and he says, Dad, Dad, listen to Mum with your heart. Listen to her feelings. Like, they are so important. And I'm thinking, yay, my son. <laughs> Wonderful. And then he turns to me. I'm not getting away with this. He turns to me and he says, Mom, listen to Dad with your mind. Because like, he's got some really useful things to say, really sensible stuff. So listen with your mind. And actually what that taught us was we were arguing in two different languages. I was emotional, I was arguing from the heart, Bernie was arguing from the head, and we might have been speaking Russian and Chinese. And that taught us something. And actually, what we found now with the research, that you have to deal with the emotions first. Calm the emotions down from the person who's more emotional, so that you can then do the oxytocin thing and access the rational brain, because when someone's emotional, they've gone into fight or flight mode, there's no having any sensible, rational discussion with them. And the more you try to be rational, the more you're not getting their feelings, and the more they make their feelings bigger, because you clearly didn't get it the first time, and so this escalates out of all proportion. So remember that. Um, remember our mistake. We've learned from that since, and now we try not to argue with the brain and the heart, because it's not going to work. We also need to know how to soothe each other. Um, Healthy couples know how to soothe each other when they start to get irritated, when they start to have conflicts, and then know how to repair the relationship when they do have a, a minor conflict about something. They repair very quickly, and that's a really important thing. How do we repair? How do we say sorry and make amends and apologize? But that's like a whole different seminar. But we need to know how to soothe each other during stressful times, because when we soothe each other, we're much less likely to have arguments. You need to laugh warmly. Laughter it helps to soothe you and warms the relationships, but not at each other, because that doesn't really work very well. Get plenty of sleep as well, because many arguments start just because we're tired. And Abigail's response was really soothing to David. You can just see how he responds so wonderfully. Ellen White has this to say about conflicts. She says, she says, when you do go to those who you think are doing wrong, she doesn't say are doing wrong, you think, because actually, you have to listen to their story and find out if they're really doing wrong, maybe you just don't understand. You must have the spirit of meekness, of kindness, and mercy, like Abigail, and be full of good fruits. And Abigail was, raisins and figs and a few other things, I'm sure. So that really helped to resolve the conflicts. Go with a gift as well, always helps. The great thing is that well-managed conflicts bring us closer together. They increase our understanding of each other's needs and views. And, and then the more we understand each other, the more we can show love to each other. And it helps us to feel confident in developing unselfish win-win ways for our conflicts. We want the other person to feel happy too. We want to bless them. We want to find a good way to solve the problem. And when we solve our problems well, that creates a relationship where we want to be more kind. And it creates a lovely, virtuous circle of getting closer and closer together and knowing how to care for each other. The challenge is the vicious circle that goes the other way. When we have rough conflicts and we stop caring because you've hurt me so much and I'm not going to be nice to you because you've just been so nasty to me. And we start to get into a vicious circle and that circle gets wider and wider and we become further and further polarized by our conflicts, and we hurt each other, and it makes it so much harder to get back together again. So where do we find the strength for these, uh, for these relationships? Where do we find the inspiration, the love? We need to be filled up first with God's love in our heart, because when God's love is filling us up with good things from Him, then our heart is full of good stuff 
to pour into each other. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So Jesus was a channel of God's love into the disciples' lives. And he said, now stay in my love. Keep my commands and stay in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remained in his love. And I have told you this, all of these loving things, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. And my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Be kind, be appreciative, be generous, protect the relationships. Do those things that will help you to reduce the conflicts in your life so that you can be peacemakers in your home, in your workplaces, in your church, in your community, with everybody. Um, and then we can be called the children of God. And that would be amazing. Now, as I've spoken here this morning, I want to think, what can you do differently from, that you've learned this morning that might change the course of one of your conflicts? What are you going to take away and try in your home, in your relationships, to make your conflicts less likely, to reduce them, to make them more gentle, to make them more manageable? How can you be the peacemaker God wants you to be? What can you do? What part can you play in the great peacemaking exercise of the universe? And what can we do together to create warm and caring churches, organizations, and families where hurtful conflicts are less likely? People are not bleeding from our community because of the conflicts, but they're coming in because they can see we are Christians by our love. Amen. stand as we sing together this prayer to close the service. Make me a channel of your peace. Let us pray. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. This is my prayer today and always. Through Jesus' name, amen. concluding remarks. So before we say farewell to you all, we say thank you to all those who made this worship possible. That includes you, Elisha, Lucas, Tim, and you thought I was going to forget you, Joshua. May you all have a blessed week. But now, as the old friend of Newbold used to say, go in peace, go with God. Mm -hmm.